Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. Let's begin our worship service today by singing, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Let's all stand as we begin our service in song. I'm glad you're here. Chris, is this it for you? Is this the grand finale for the Tykler family? Well, I've got to say, you've been a blessing. You really have. And I'm going to miss you. I'm even going to miss Benjamin. So, it's been fun watching y'all grow up. Uh, Sarah, I only have one request. I want you to, about every other month, post a normal picture of the kids on Facebook. I know that's kind of a hard thing to do, but we want to continue to see them grow up. And so it's been fun to watch. Uh, we're glad that all of you are here this morning. And praise the Lord, we've got some new people here today. You just don't really understand how much of a blessing that is to see you here today. Uh, do us a favor. There's a perforated edge in your bulletin. And um, we basically will want to know your name it's important to us. We want to know you as a person. We won't be calling you at weird hours or sending you emails every other day or anything like that. But we really do want to know you by name, and that would help us. So fill that out. Put it in the offering plates when you exit. I guess by now everybody knows that this half exits that way and this half exit that way. Uh, we're trying to keep the traffic flow going this way. So. Uh, thank you for helping us with that. Uh, look in your uh, bulletin to the announcement section. There's a lot going on. I tell you, for COVID and weirdness, there's a lot of things happening at church. And that's good. It's great to be with you and, and around people, even if it is at a distance. There's really three things I want to mention this morning. First of all, we are going to go to phase three on August the 9th. Everything is tentative. Every time we say it's going to be this way, a week later it's like this. So we're all kind of becoming conditioned to kind of know that things are changing. But we've got it on our schedule, and uh, we're trying to help the church uh, today to what it's going to look like on the other side of COVID. And so uh, we're going to start phase three, and about twice a week, uh, beginning last Friday, you received a, a sheet uh, through email that kind of outlined the way it would look. Uh, we're going to have it for every age group, and it's going to be in person and on Zoom. So it's going to be hybrid classes. So pray for me, the non-super technology person, as we set all that up. I can do technology, and I love it but I'm not used to having to do everything like that at church, but it's working so far. Um, but one thing we need help with, um, preschool. 
A lot of our workers are over 60 and they're high risk, and so we're not asking them to do Sunday school. Uh, so we're doing two extended sessions. We're going down to two preschool classes each hour. I guess you know there'll be two hours of Sunday school. And what that means is that people will rotate in for one hour once a month just to help keep our, our babies. And the two classes will be bed babies through twos, then threes and fours, and then kindergarten's gonna go with younger children to children's Sunday school. But we, we need 32 people to make it work. And as of Friday, we had 17, okay? We really haven't advertised it yet, but this week uh, you're going to start seeing uh, some online polls and ways to sign up. But if you're interested and you can help, we need you. It'd be once a month. And so you can call me, you can email me, uh, or you can fill out the online uh, registration to do that, and we'll contact you and get you on the schedule. Uh, look inside also at the classes that we have going on by Zoom. Uh, we, everything's going on by Zoom these days. What did we do before Zoom? <laughs> uh, I never even heard of the word Zoom, but um, we've got three classes, discipleship classes starting. Um, you can see the details about each one of those. Uh, two of them will start on the 9th, and one will be the next Wednesday night. Um, my classes, you can email me or call me, and I'll put you on my list. And we've already got people signing up, so it's going to be pretty cool stuff. Um, last thing is Operation Christmas Child. Uh, Y'all know these boxes, and you know what all that means. Every year we collect uh, Christmas gifts for children's. And what you do is you get a box, there's some out in the foyer here, and inside there's instructions about how to pack it, and uh, there's also brochures about how to pack it. But children all over the world will receive uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christmas gifts, and most of them it would be the first Christmas gift they've ever received. And they'll, they'll be toys, they'll be clothes, uh, there'll be all kinds of different things, hygiene, things in the boxes but it's a great ministry so we're collecting stuff for these now so go by and get one of your boxes one of these boxes on your way out all right I want you to stand stretch your legs a little bit look around see who ha you haven't hugged in six months and wave and give them the old Baptist hug this is what we're doing these days this is a great crowd this morning God bless you for being here all right Chris Come do your thing one last time. Once more unto the breach. Right? It was about five years ago that we first came here, and uh, it was temporary because I was the interim before J.K. Uh, came. And we loved being here, and we're sad when we had to leave, and then uh, opportunity came up for Sarah to get on staff and we were back and it's been great and uh, we're sorry that we have to go again um, but you know God moves his chess pieces where he wants them so um, but anyway so thank you thank you very much uh, let's continue with our uh, time of worship this morning let's sing I am thine O Lord <laughs>
Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Psalms, from the probably the greatest worship leader of all time, King David. Psalms 138. I will give thanks, excuse me, I will give you thanks with all my heart and will sing praises to you before the gods. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word according to your all your name. On the day I called you, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. And they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For thou, the Lord, is exalted, yet he regards the lowly, but he naught he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, I will, you will revive me. You will, strength, you will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your knowledge, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your almighty hand. Father, we know that we are walking in the midst of troubled times these days, but we look at your promises that you are always with us. Father, we pray for the ones who have lost loved ones, for those who are sick in hospitals, for those who are going on to bigger and better things. Father, we pray for the cease of turmoil in our country. Father, we know that history will be history. But Father, we look forward to the future for brighter and better things. In thy name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord through song by singing, Shine, Jesus, shine, and thou art worthy.
Rhonda, Miss Rhonda Bagby. Most of you know that I have to move away to Kansas in a couple weeks, but Miss Rhonda is going to take over as children's minister. She has been at church for more than 20 years. She's been involved in VBS and GAs and youth. And the thing you guys, most of you probably know best, is Fall Fest. Miss Rhonda is in charge of Fall Fest. So um, you're gonna get to know her really well. She really is great. Um, but I thought it would be fun for us to ask her some questions. So I was wondering, Miss Rhonda, what is your favorite thing about church besides these great kids, of course? Well, Sarah, I love coming to church with my family and seeing my friends. I also always feel like I'm surrounded by people who love me. And when I'm at church, I know that I'm loving everybody who's around us. Even at my age, I still learn new things about God every single time I come to church. So coming to church, learning about Jesus, and praying with my church family is the best way that I know to start out the week. That sounds great. Thank you. So, Miss Sarah, we're all going to miss you and your family so very much. Um, what is your, the thing that you're most proud of from the last three years that you've been here at Ash Creek? The thing that I am most proud of is how much scripture these kids have memorized in the last three years. They, I'm seeing... Oh man, they have memorized a lot of scripture. And I hope and pray that you kids will keep on hiding God's word in your heart because that's what you need for God. God speaks to you through all those scriptures that you have memorized um, during times that you need wisdom and that you need guidance from him. So keep on memorizing scripture. Ms. Rhonda, what are you most looking forward to about being the children's minister? Well, I am most looking forward to getting to know each child personally and getting to know their families as well. I can't wait to spend time together having fun and learning more about Jesus. Awesome. Is there anything else you want the kids to know? Well, I want everyone to know that even though church and Sunday school 
look different right now. Maybe you're at home. Maybe you're at church wearing a mask in person. It's not exactly how we really want to be doing things. It is kind of weird. But just remember, God's in control, and He will work things out for us to be together again soon. Thank you. That is, that is good words. Well, today's passage is in John chapter 9. And uh, a man was blind from the time he was born, and Jesus came and healed him. Close your eyes so you can feel what it might be like if you couldn't see. Close your eyes tight. You can't see anything around you. That would be really hard. Okay, open your eyes back up. Some people thought that the man was blind because of someone's sin. But Jesus said, no, it's to show God's power through healing him. Even when bad things happen, God is still working for our good. This pandemic is pretty bad, but even through this hard time, God is still showing his great power and his love for us. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. What a good God we serve. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you promise that you are working all things, even bad things, for our good. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to miss you, Sarah. <laughs> Let's all uh, stand and sing together one of the great hymns of our faith, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound.
prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace to us, that you see us in our weakness and come to aid us, come to save us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your redemptive work for us, that we can be in relationship with you. Father, we thank you for all the ways that you've blessed this church, and we pray that you will uh, continue to have uh, your hand upon uh, everyone here, the leadership here, and that you will continue to uh, work your will and your purposes through the ministry here at Ash Creek. We ask that you will continue to provide all that is needed for uh, the church and for uh, all of the members and attenders and visitors that uh, you will show yourself as the, uh, the mighty provider. Father, we ask also that you will uh, help us to uh, carry on through this pandemic, that you will bring healing to those that are sick, that you will uh, uh, work through the doctors and uh, uh, medical technicians and everyone that uh, uh, we will uh, see this come to an end uh, sooner than, uh, than, we can, than we can hope. Father, continue to be with us in the rest of our service now. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sarah and Teichler family. We are going to miss you. In fact, I want you all to come up here right now, all of you. I know Chris is excited about this. Do you all come on up here? Turn around and look. Let's give them a hand. We do, we do want to say thank you to Sarah. Thank you, Chris, for leading today. JK is in Colorado on vacation, and so it worked out great that you could lead us today. Sarah will be here next week, but the rest of them are going to leave tomorrow. And uh, we just want to express our love to you and tell you how much we have appreciated your ministry, Sarah, through these years. And... They're about to get a new house. They've been living in an apartment, and they're about to get a new house. And so we wanted to give them a gift that might help to get some things uh, for their new house. And there's a little bit more coming also that is not in that envelope. So, uh, but we just, Sarah, uh, 
thank you so much for blessing us and blessing our children uh, through these years, both with children's ministry and with music, and we are so grateful. And as Chris expressed a while ago, we will miss you. And, <laughs> but I'm going to miss the rest of your family, too. Benjamin and Jenna and Josh and Chris and, well, I just don't know what else to say about it except that uh, we're very sorry. We're, gonna, we're, great to have, we're glad that Rhonda's coming on, but we're going to miss Sarah and uh, the rest of this family. And one thing that we're going to miss is what we just saw here uh, with this great music that we have. So thank you all, and we also have this gift of flowers for you. And we love you. Thanks. Now, you may be seated. And you can go, yeah. <laughs> Chris can't wait to get down there. Now, uh, ordinarily, we would have a reception or something, a party or something uh, for that, for this. But under the circumstances, we're not really able to do that. And you'll want to... Uh, say thank you to Sarah in your own way, I know. But also, today is Connie's last day as our pianist, and she has been our pianist for 33 years. Now, we're going to recognize her more in two or three weeks. They're going to be here through August before they move. But, Connie, today we wanted to give you some flowers, so come on up here. And we want to thank you, Connie, and we're going to do more to recognize her in a couple of, in two or three weeks. Uh, next week, our new pianist will be here, and I know that that will be a blessing to us as well, but Connie, we uh, are going to miss you and Gillis uh, when you do move in, in sometime in August, but we'll be able to say more about that later. All right, let's move along. It is time to go to our text in John chapter 9. John chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. John chapter 9, beginning with verse 1, and reading through verse 12. As he went along, talking about Jesus, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in this world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he, asked him, but he himself insisted, I am that man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. And he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. And he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Here's mud in your eye. For an idiom that sounds so disgusting, it really is meant for good luck. It's a phrase that you might hear more in a British pub than you would in America. It is a toast for right before people 
down a pint of ale in the pub, so I know that the occasion to use the phrase, here's mud in your eye, has never made its way amongst us Baptists. Here's mud in your eye, a toast of good health and well-being. No one really knows where this phrase came from. Some people think that it came from World War I when soldiers were slopping around in the mud of the trenches and people would get mud in their eye. But scholars have discovered that this phrase is seen long before the First World War. In fact, now most scholars think that this phrase came from the racetrack back in the 1870s. And it had something to do with riding the winning horse. And everybody behind you got mud in their eyes as you threw mud up into their face. Now, I'm not sure how that then translated into a wish for good health and well-being. But it seems to me that having mud in your eye would not be a good thing at all, whether it was at the racetrack or in the pub. But for a blind man on the side of the road, mud in his eye turned out to be a really good thing. Jesus was walking along one day and he saw this man who had been blind from birth. And for some reason, Jesus thinks that putting mud in his eye would be good for him. Here's mud in your eye, Jesus said to the man. Now, before we get to the mud part of the story, I want to go back to the blind part of the story. Jesus saw this man who had been blind from birth, and the disciples saw his blindness too. It raised a theological question in the minds of these disciples. Who sinned, they wanted to know, this man or his parents? The question seems very strange to us because we know that all kinds of biological and scientific problems can cause maladies such as blindness, but the folks in Jesus' day... They just assumed that every tragedy was caused by sin and every sickness was well-deserved. They probably had in mind that passage of Scripture in Exodus that said that the sins of the fathers would be passed down through the generations, and so it was no stretch for them to think that this man's parents had been involved in some scandalous act that brought about this disaster. It might be stretching it a little bit further to assume that this blindness was caused by this man's sin since he had been blind from birth. I mean, what had he done? Had he somehow sinned so scandalously as an embryo in his mother's womb that he was, it resulted in being born blind? Some rabbis thought that was possible. Of one thing they were certain, though, somebody sinned. But I think what the disciples were really asking is, whose fault is this? Who caused this terrible thing? What were the circumstances that should not have happened that made this happen? And that sounds kind of familiar because, you know, whenever something goes wrong, the first thing to do is to blame somebody. It begins as children when the baseball flies through the kitchen window and both brothers point at the other one and say, he did it. Things get more serious, though, as time goes on. Whose fault is it? that millions of people have been infected by the coronavirus and hundreds of thousands have died? Whose fault is it that there are riots in the street and racial animus in our nation? Whose fault is it that the economy has collapsed and people, maybe you, have lost your job? Whose fault is that? When, business, when your business fails, 
or the stock market crashes, or your child is sick, or divorce is looming, whose fault is it? You've probably said that yourself when you have been in the midst of malady. What did I do to deserve this? Because we need to fix blame somewhere, even if we have to blame it on ourselves, because at least that way it's explainable. I have to admit that I am very much like these disciples who saw this man born blind and decided to use him as an object lesson for what can go wrong if you don't straighten up and fly right. I admit I might see a beggar on the corner, a homeless person holding up a cardboard sign. My first thought is, I wonder what that guy did to deserve that. Did he have bad parents or did he just make bad decisions himself? Did he ruin himself with drugs or was he just born lazy? If my kids are with me, I might even use that person as an object lesson on why it's important to study math <laughs> or to study your, to do good in school. If you don't do better in school, I used to tell them, you're going to end up just like that one of these days. I'm not sure that that warning did any good. <laughs> but I think I know why we need to know who is at fault when bad things happen. Because it helps us to explain in our minds and in our spirit, it helps us to explain why people suffer. If we can fix blame on somebody or something, then we can just avoid whatever it is that, that those other people did wrong, and then we won't suffer, we figure. A woman dies of lung cancer, and we assuage ourselves thinking, well, you know, she smoked a lot. And since we don't smoke, we can feel better about that. A man suffers from liver failure, and we wonder, I wonder if he drinks too much. We sort of hope so, because then it would at least be explicable, and we wouldn't feel ourselves in danger if we don't drink too much. What's the first thing that you assume when someone dies of AIDS? We know how people get AIDS most of the time anyway. Kind of makes us feel better, I guess, to just think, well, they, I guess they deserved it. At least that's not my problem. And so these disciples, they see this man who is born blind and they need an explanation for that. Lord, who sinned? Was it this man? Was it his parents? There had to be sin somewhere. Because they needed to blame something or someone so that they could feel better about the situation. Look how Jesus answers. Jesus does not answer in terms of what caused this problem. He doesn't fix the blame. Jesus answers in terms of purpose. Not fault. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Don't get Jesus wrong here, because Jesus is not saying that suffering is never caused by sin. Obviously, sometimes suffering is caused by sin, even our own individual sin. Babies are born sick sometimes because a mother could not control a crack habit. Drinking too much, it really can lead to liver damage. And so some suffering really is a direct result of bad behavior, you know? But sometimes, sometimes bad things just happen. And it's not anybody's fault. It just happens. In the case of this man born blind, it was not his fault. It was not his parents' fault. It happened. 
And Jesus says that it happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now at first, when I first read this passage, it disturbs me a little bit because that answer sort of seems like it assumes that Jesus is accusing God of causing this man's blindness in order to use him for some kind of divine freak show, almost as if God made this happen to this man for this very moment. Then I read it again more carefully. I don't really think that's what happened. For one thing, the God that I know does not play games with folks to show off. Um, to show off. Jesus is not saying that God caused this man's blindness, but he is saying that God can use this man's blindness for his purpose. It seems to me that what Jesus is saying is that fixing the blame is not that important. What is important is to see the opportunity that this situation gives to pe for people to see God at work. My friend George Mason says it like this, the disciples see a blind man, but Jesus sees a man who is born blind. They see a diagnosis, he sees a person. They see a disability, he sees a possibility. They go to cause, he goes to purpose. They want to know why, but he gives them what for. Methodist Bishop Will Willeman tells about a reporter who called him when that tsunami struck over in Asia several years ago. You remember that? The tsunami came and it killed hundreds of thousands of people. And the reporter said to him, I'm doing a story on the tsunami and its aftermath. How do you as a person of faith explain this event? And so Willeman thought about it a little while, and he thought about telling him, well, I'm not an oceanographer, but I think that the Earth's crust cools and the plates shift and an earthquake happens and tremors set off this huge wave at sea. At least that's what I picked up on the Discovery Channel, he wanted to say. But of course, that's not what the reporter was after. What the reporter was after was, how can a Christian explain why God did such a thing? Some people have explained it that God was wiping out Muslims and Hindus. If so, God didn't do a very good job of that. But Jesus has a different kind of answer. He's not blaming God. He's not blaming others. He just says, you know, when suffering happens, when bad things happen, God can use that as an opportunity for us to see God's work being done. Here's the thing. When the disciples saw this man born blind, they wanted to have a theological discussion about what caused the problem. But Jesus just got busy doing God's work. There was no time to sit around and have a theological debate when somebody was in need. Jesus said, in essence, we just need to make hay while the sun's shining. So without further ado, he spit on the ground and he knelt down to kneel the dirt into mud. Incidentally, he was breaking the Sabbath law that said that you could not knead on the Sabbath day. And then he smears that mud on his eyes. And I cannot help but go back to the creation story. When God created the man out of the dust of the ground, and now God is taking that very dust and is fulfilling God's purpose of recreation. So go wash in the pool of Siloam, he says to the man, and he does it, and he can see. Whose fault was this blindness? It's just not important, Jesus says. But what is important is that we have this opportunity now to see God at work. There's a whole lot of blame going on these days. 
whose fault is the mess that we are in? I guess that we could trace back certain things to certain policies or certain decisions or whatever and maybe fix the blame on somebody here or somebody there for all of the myriad things that are going on in our world. But I think that Jesus is calling us to a higher level of looking. Not to fix blame as much as to see what God can do when things look hopeless, when things are bad, when suffering is occurring, what glory can we see from God as He goes to work in this world? Who sinned, this homeless man or his parents? Who sinned, this beggar or, the, or his folks? Neither. Both, maybe. But maybe our eyes can be opened and see an opportunity for God to be at work. The story of the man born blind does not end at the end of verse 12. Fault-finding and fruitless accusations keep this story alive for another 28 verses. The Pharisees fault Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. They blame the parents. They accuse the man of lying about being blind in the first place. Maybe they just, and then finally they just kick him out of the synagogue. It just serves him right, they figure, to kick him out. Obviously, he was a sinner letting himself get healed on the Sabbath. But he doesn't care. He's seen God at work. Maybe we could use a little mud in our eyes. Maybe in the midst of pandemic and racism and riot and unrest, a little mud could help us see God at work. Admittedly, you might need to wash away some things in the pool, maybe wash away some pride and prejudice and blame and shame before you look. But somehow, Miraculously, you might just be able to see God in the midst of disaster. So here's mud in your eye. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you are a God who has loved us, a God who has saved us, a God whom, even when we were at the very depths, you lifted us up and rescued us. And you have, and even though we were blind, you have made it to where we can see. And now we give you praise and glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe just today you have received a little mud in your eye. And Jesus has opened your eyes. And you've seen something new, something different. Maybe you're here today, or maybe you are watching online, and you are ready to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Well, you know, don't worry about what other people say. Don't worry about what your problems are. Listen, if you've got something in your life that's making you blind, open your heart to Jesus. And you'll be able to see. Open your heart in faith. If you're here today and you'd like to make that kind of decision, I'll be hanging around down here after, after worship for just a few moments, not for very long. If you're watching us online, if you will go to our website, then you can uh, find under the Worship and Sunday School tab a decision tab. And you can fill out a form on that decision tab. And we'll get back in touch with you. We want to talk to you about the decision that you've made today. You can also unite with our church, with Ash Creek Baptist Church, either here in person or online through that decision tab. Now may God bless you and God keep you. May he keep you safe, keep you well. And I pray that our eyes will be open this week to see God at work. Chris, come and lead us in our clothes.
Our closing song is the chorus from the song, Send the Light. Let's all stand as we close our service this morning in song. Send the light, the blessed gospel.